Pastor Ken up here and listen to the word God's got for us through him today. And 
Laban agrees to give him Rebekah as a bride if he'll work for him for seven years. Rachel. Rachel, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you're sitting in the front row so you can correct it. <laughs> I have that problem. You know, I'll use a different word and I just hope you translate it. Uh, it's not quite talking in tongues, but it's close. Okay. <laughs> And so he says, work for me for seven years and you can have Rachel as your bride. And so that takes place, the wedding takes place. He gets up the next morning. Now, why it took him the morning to figure this out, I'm not sure and we're not told. But he gets up the next morning and he, then he goes to Laban and he says, what's going on? You told me I could have Rachel. And he says, well, you know, it's not our custom here to give the younger daughter before we give the older daughter. So, you got me. And he finds out, and he says, <coughs> he argues a little bit with him, and he says, well, I'll tell you what, work for me seven more years, and you can have Rachel. But he says, if you'll just make the first week with Leah and then work seven more years, I'll throw Rachel into the bunch here. And so he got Rachel. And then we read the play. Jacob's love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. Because remember, Rachel was very attractive and they said Leah had weak eyes, whatever that means. If she needed glasses, I don't know. But so that's that's where that segment ends. You just said, work seven more years, you can have Rachel, and we'll move forward. And then we move into a segment that I called the boys. And this is an interesting one. Jacob's family is now set up this way. He's got Leah for a wife. Her handmaid is Zilpah. He's got Rachel for a wife. Her handmaid is Billa. And we find this out. That when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. God is always in control of what's going on, isn't he? And so he keeps Rachel from having children. And of course, that was a very, very big deal, much more than it is in our culture, that the wife provide children. And so Leah has four kids, four sons. There's Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And these, this family is going to become what we refer to as the 12 tribes of Israel. And then, when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous. So she said, Jacob, give me children or I'll die. You go down to the fertility clinic and see whether this is your problem or my problem, okay? And Jacob became angry with her. And he says, I'm not in the place of God that's kept you from having children. So Rachel just does the natural thing. She gives him her handmaid to be his wife and bear children. Oh, come on. <laughs> now, their culture is very different than ours. <laughs> you can see that with all these wives. I was talking to somebody before we uh, got together today, and they were talking about all these wives that people like Jacob had, like a even Abraham, David, Solomon. I just thought of Solomon calling up one Valentine's Day and say, can I have a nice private table for a thousand and one people? <laughs> said he had a thousand wives. I mean, how do you keep track of that for anniversaries, birthdays? <laughs> well, I could barely do it for one. But anyway, so she says, here's Bill and my servant, sleep with her, and she can bear children for me, and I can build a family through her. So she gave him her servant, Bill. Jacob slept with her, and she became pregnant, bore him a son. And while things were going well, got a second one. 
Now, Lita's upset. She'd stopped having children, so she took Zilpah, gave her to Jacob, and she bore a son. Matter of fact, she bore two. Did you read through that? One of the questions I've asked you to think about, and you talk about it in your group, if, if you read the names of these kids, of these boys, you find out that there's some significance to what's going on. They weren't just casual names. This wasn't a family name or what have you. There's something significant about these names, and you can talk about that in your group. All right. During the harvest, Reuben goes out to the field. He found some mandrake plants, and he brought them to Leah. And Rachel said to Leah, give me some of your son's mandrakes. Now, they thought that mandrakes were kind of a fertility medicine. Uh, I did a little search on that, and these are what mandrakes look like. They, they look like people. They were the root of a plant. And they thought, okay, there must be something to these. So she said, and Leah said, hey, wasn't it enough that you took my husband? You know? Give me, you can't, y'all give me the mandrakes, but Rachel, he can sleep with you tonight in return for the son's mandrakes. So they're trading Jacob off. Okay? You can see why the Disney Channel isn't going to yeah. do this movie. So, and that's, that's it's really, I find it kind of fascinating. Jake comes, comes in from the field, and Leah went out and says, you have to sleep with me tonight because I traded you off for some mandrakes. <laughs> Jacob says, okay. <laughs> and God listened to Leah, she became pregnant, and she bore a fifth son. And then she had another one and she had two more sons. And then God remembered Rachel. And he enabled her to conceive. She became pregnant to a son, and God has taken away my disgrace. And she named him Joseph and said, May the Lord give me even one more. And so she has two children. This family is messed up. Okay. There's no getting around it. And you know, these boys had to be at each other as well. The wives were obviously at each other. And so that's where this second part ends in regards to the boys and what's going on. But now we come to a very key piece that I've called the beginning because Jacob is about to turn the corner. And let's set the stage for this. Jacob's 14 years are done. He wants to go back to his father Isaac. And Jacob's made a way, been very, very prosperous. He's done a really great job working for him for those 14 years, and now he wants to work on his own. And Laban says, hey, wait a minute. <coughs> I don't really want to let you go. He says, tell me your wages, and you uh, please stay, and I'll pay you what you want. And so Jacob says, well, hey, I'll tell you what. Let's separate the livestock. You take all the white goats and sheep, and I'll take the spotted and speckled ones, and I'll keep those for me. And those were rarer than the white ones. So Jacob says, or Laban says, agreed, let's do it. That's what they think is going to happen. So six years go by with Laban and Jacob trying to outmaneuver each other. And if you read that passage, uh, you found out that they were each trying to fool the other one. Jacob does a thing that's now called, I looked this up, it's called the theory of prenatal conditioning by visual impressions. Now, I had some uh, relatives who were on a farm, but I'd never heard this term before. And when I read that story that, okay, he just puts these things in front of the sheep when they're mating, and then they'll have a spe speckled and spotted one or something like that, 
And I said, oh, come on. That's, there is actually a theory called prenatal conditioning to visual impressions. So if you have kids or grandkids that are trying to have speckled and spotted kids, <laughs> here's a verse that will tell you about how to do it. Laban keeps changing Jacob's wages all the time. He said, well, let's, let's switch. And then whatever Jacob's sheep and livestock were having, those would be the ones that were profitable. So Jacob keeps growing prosperous. Laban's sons are getting upset. And Laban's attitude toward Jacob is changing. So Jacob says, i got to get out of town. This is no good. But before that, the Lord says to him, go back. I want you to go back to the land of your fathers, to your relatives, and I will be with you. I will take care of you. But I want you to remember that phrase, go back, because we're going to come back to that in a little bit. <coughs> so, he makes Leah and Rachel aware of the fact that he's going to leave. He says, I see that your father's attitude toward me is not what it was before, but the God of my father has been with me. So God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. And Jacob packs up to leave. And Rachel, being the very wonderful, good person that she is, steals the gods from Laban who apparently worshipped idols and false gods. <coughs> Excuse me. And she steals those. So, <coughs> Laban finds out what happened to these. Jacob's gone. My gods are gone. So he catches up with Jacob. I read somewhere today he had about a three or four day head start before Jacob took off after him. He was about 300 miles away when Laban caught up with it. So he was hauling to catch up and make that distance in just those the three days that he had. But God comes to Laban and warns him in a dream. And he says, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad, let it alone. I thought it was interesting. Here's a man who worshipped idols. And God comes to him in a dream and tells him, here's what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to handle this situation. <laughs> Laban sort of obeys. Because if you read what happens, Laban goes to Jacob and he says, what have you done? Now this doesn't sound like saying nothing good or bad. <laughs> he says, you deceived me. You carried off my daughters like captives in a war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why did you tell me so I could, and as I read this next phrase, so that I could just send them off with joy and singing, it just seems out of character for Jacob, to, or for Laban to me. Keep correcting me, Bob, because I'm going to use the wrong name here. He says, you didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and daughters goodbye. You've done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you, but last night, and now he tells Jacob, that God had come to him and warned him not to do this. And, but because you long to return to your father's household, but why did you steal my gods? Jacob says what? He says, he explains what was going on. He explained that God came to him. And he says, we didn't steal any of your gods. And so he says, go ahead and search. Search everything among all of my entourage here. And if you find them, I'm not going to be real happy. But, but Jacob, why would he tell him that? He didn't think that he had them. He didn't expect any of his crew to have taken the gods. So Laban goes through and he searches. Turns up nothing because of Rachel's lie. He's going through. He's searching saddlebags. He's searching all of their, you know, everything they have in the trailer. And... He comes to Rachel, who's hidden them under her saddle, and she says, oh, excuse me, I can't get up. It's that time. And Laban buys it. 
So he said, okay, I understand. We'll let it go. And now Jacob's mad at Laban. He says, look, you accused me falsely. I didn't have these. So they make a pact. And they set up these stones. And they make a pact. And it says that they're going to get along from this point on. And then Laban heads home. And Jacob returns to his area. I want to go back to this statement where the Lord said, go back. He's telling him, I want things to be different for you, Jacob. I want you to go back. And if you remember, I have this spiritual barometer for Jacob. And it keeps getting darker and darker, which is all. Okay. And we come to this point, and he tells him to go back. Now, you probably <clears throat> wondered, why would anybody make an outline in the shape of a horseshoe? It's because I think Jacob turned the corner here in his heading back. And you'll notice some interesting things with this uh, statement of go back. Because in this section, he had an ignoring family problems and he had some family strife. But as he goes back, he begins to face his family problems. And he has some personal strife. Instead of struggling with man, next week we're going to look at him struggling with God. He was breaking family <laughs> ties when he got banished. And now he comes back and he's going to restore these ties. Instead of being self-centered, deceiving, deceiving, and insensitive, we're going to find him being caring, caring open, and sensitive to people. And it's not that he's undoing his sin, but he's going back and he's, he's changing. He's changing from what he was like. God told him to go back, and he was doing that. And so, Jacob is becoming a changed person. Are we willing to become changed people? Most of would say, I kind of like myself. There's some things I get annoyed with. My wife points those out to me regularly. <laughs> One of the things that we need to ask ourselves that we're doing that needs to change, that we need to undo, and Jacob was addressing those issues. That's why, as we look at this, his spiritual barometer is going up the farther he goes back and the farther he corrects some of that behavior. So some closing thoughts. I mean, we've done a high-level look at this this week to see how the story goes. But two things jumped out at me that I've been reading lately. One is in Romans. And I looked at this, I said, one, why is this going on? Why is God letting this happen? And I was reading this verse just a couple days ago. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. If you're like me, you look around and say every once in a while, why is God letting this happen? Why did God let COVID happen? Why did this disease hit me? And the depth of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments. God is God Almighty. He is beyond us. I can't search out his mind. But faith says, I trust him. And I believe in him. His paths are beyond tracing out who has known the mind of the Lord. And as I mentioned last week, I am so glad that I can't comprehend God. Because that would make him no more than just another person. And we're 
we're seeing in this story. God working in ways that we would never put them together that way. But God did. God did it with Jacob and all of these sons that he had through all of the, through his two different wives and their two handmaids and the problems with Laban. God is using things in our life where he's trying to shape us to be the kind of men and women he wants us to be. And I've got to say, am I willing to go back? Am I willing to change some of those things? The other verse that hit me this week is from Psalms. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Why does God bother with you and I at all? <coughs> He's an almighty, infinite God. He spoke and worlds came into existence. If it's still clear tonight, go out and look. Look up. And I don't know if you've done that recently, but you look up and you say, what an amazing universe God made for us. Why is he even concerned for me? Because he loves me. Because he cares for me. It's hard to imagine an infinite God that would care for, I'll use the term, insignificant people like you and I. But he does. His ways are beyond our finding out. His ways are amazing. And for that, we need to be thankful and learn the lessons that God has chosen to communicate to us through his word. So I've left you some questions. As you think about the brides, how do you see Galatians 6, 7 working in them? How do the names of Jacob's sons tell what's going on? You can almost write the story between Leah and Rachel by looking at the sons' names that are there. And the other thing is what signs of change do you begin to see in Jacob? And don't you see some things that he's still got to work on? So think about those, talk about those. Jacob is a fascinating study. A study in people, in character, in relationships with God. Uh, when I put together messages and studies, I always ask myself three questions. What does it say? What does it mean? What am I going to do about it? And without that last question, the other two questions haven't bought me much. I might understand it, but the key question is, what am I going to do about it? What can I learn from the life of, J life of Jacob that helps me shape my own life more to what God wants it to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the examples you give us in Scripture. We don't understand why you do things the way you do, why you even bother to love us, send your Son to pay the price for our sin, but you have. And we fall at your feet in worship and praise and thanksgiving and confession because you want us to change you want us to shape us to be conformed to the image of your son and we thank you for that and we ask that you guide us on that path we ask these things in Jesus name